out and talk about and hear about Frederick Douglass. Uh, before I introduce our special guests, I just want to go over a couple things. Um, we'll have a talk today for about, I don't know, 45 minutes, something like that. Does that sound good? And then we're going to have a reception. Well, then we'll have questions here. We're taping the, we're taping the, uh, um, this event. So please don't just raise your hand and shout your question, because people who are listening to the taping won't be able to hear it. So if you do have a question at the end, there are microphones set up at either side. And please do come up and ask those questions. We do want to hear. We do want to have a little Q&A section. After the question and answer, we'll have a reception across the hall in the fishbowl. Is that right? They're not set up yet. OK, it is. Uh, so we'll be in the fishbowl. I do encourage you, please stay for that and talk to your friends, meet some new friends, talk to a professor about what you heard today and what you learned. It's an important part of what the humanities program, uh, what, the, uh, what we're doing here. I want to start with a few thank yous. I want to thank the humanities program, the development of Western civilization program, the history department, and especially the Gladys Brooks Endowment uh, for supporting this lecture series. And now, if I can begin with an introduction of our special guest today, David Blight. David Blight teaches at Yale and has taught at various other schools you may have heard of, including Cambridge, Amherst, Harvard, and perhaps most importantly, for four years at Flint Northern High School. Uh, for seven years at Flint Northern High School. He is a successful academic at the top of his field, and he has written many books. I'm not going to give you a list. A lot of students are here. I'm going to give you a little different introduction, because usually in an introduction, we just sort of list the books and awards, um, which, by the way, you just sit there as an academic, you're like, wow, that's a lot of books and a lot of awards. Um, but I, I'm going to sort of narrate a little bit. His two most important books have won between them the uh, Pulitzer Prize for History, Abraham Lincoln Prize twice, Bancroft twice, Prize twice, um, and the Frederick Douglass Prize, which he only won once because he wasn't eligible the second time, because he actually runs the organization that gives it out. Um, as I mentioned, the winning two prizes, and, and if most students here won't know this, the Bancroft is the most prestigious prize in the historical profession, so winning it twice is no small feat. In fact, I remember a graduate seminar where we were reading um, Bernard Balin's Voyagers to the West, taught by Peter Hoffer, and he was, and we were ripping the book apart, and it had won a Pulitzer Prize, and Peter Hoffer had been Bernard Balin's student. And, he's, and he's got, he has to defend it, and finally he gets up and he says, guys, it's not any easier to win a Pulitzer the second time. So he's done this, he's won multiple, multiple awards. Although I also want to point out one award he didn't win. David Blight, I, well, I could point out lots. He hasn't won the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize for Literature. I think those are just waiting. He has not won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography. Hmm, oversight, huh? Instead, he won the Pulitzer Prize for History for his biography of Frederick Douglass. The History Prize is a larger pool and it was such a good biography, the committee decided that it wasn't just the best biography of the year, it was the best historical work of the year. Quite an accomplishment. In addition, to uh, his publishing has led him uh, to the peaks of the academic realm. At Yale, a school you may have heard of down the road, an easy, an easy train ride away, he is a sterling professor of history, which is the most prestigious professorship at Yale University. He also has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's been the past president of the Society of American Historians. And perhaps for us the most important, he has an honorary degree from Dominican College in New York, which is a Dominican university. So there you go. He's, he's, he's connected to us there. His success in the academy has made him prominent in ways that he has become not just a scholar, but a public intellectual. His work appears regularly in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The New York Times. The Atlantic, he just has an article this week on how we should, uh, how we should think about high school education, um, which I encourage you to read. Uh, he's also um, the head of the Gilder Lehrman uh, Institute at Yale, which is one of the most important institutions for really spreading the, the learning 
that has been done in the academy and spreading it to the high schools and into the colleges. Uh, it's an incredible work, an incredible job, an incredible institution. And it's really great that we have David Blight there. I want to close with the last thing, which is um, his book on Frederick Douglass, which he will talk about today, has been optioned to Netflix. So you, hopefully, he says it's not anytime soon, but you're all young. So hopefully, before long, you will get to see the Frederick Douglass movie or miniseries or however they imagine doing it. It will be a great thing when it happens. It's my pleasure to introduce to you David Blight. Well, thank you, Patrick. That's uh, one of those introductions. I wish my mother had lived to hear. Uh, she died before almost all of that happens. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you all the students who came today, uh, whether required or not. Uh, and particularly to the faculty who came to this wonderful lunch we just had. We just had, a, I don't know, 10 of us or so at a lunch where we, you know, we did our usual bitching about our profession, and, uh, but we really had a, a knockdown, drag out discussion of how, how folks teach Douglas here. And I have to tell you, I don't know how many times I've spoken on Douglas, Hinder, and Jan, both after this new biography, but even well before. Who knows how many times, but there's nothing like talking about Mr. D with people who've actually read him and actually know something. So I'm counting on you. Um, we're living in a... <laughs> Perhaps it goes without saying, but we're living in a particularly, oh, whatever, troubling and sensitive time about how we choose to use history, how we choose to learn from history, learn from figures like a Douglas, who does have a certain transcendent um, place now in American history and letters. Uh, we're reading now for his writing, thank God. Uh, but we're living in a moment of uh, intensive, best term for it is probably history wars. Um, if you haven't noticed, well, once again, this is not new. We've, Americans have done this many times before. We went through three or four roiling history wars very much public wars, politically, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, we've had them intermittently for many years. Americans have always had a history war over how to process the meaning and memory of our civil war. I wrote a long book on that. Uh, our history war no wars now have many different forms, but they actually take a certain pattern. And I want to connect Douglas to this. They take a certain pattern. Something emerges in our culture that involves the past. It's usually something, the subject is usually something quite visceral that people care about. Otherwise, they wouldn't fight about it, right? We wouldn't be fighting about monuments unless those monuments were a problem or troubled us. Secondly, they then quickly, these history wars, when they emerge, they, they usually quickly involve curriculum, schools, state legislatures. How is the past being disseminated to the young? We're a democracy. We believe in public education. Uh, it's arguable that the greatest thing the United States ever invented was that thing called a public school, which democratized education and made it possible for so many millions. But it's where we have to fight some of these things out. A third stage uh, these history wars go through is that they then become, unfortunately, and sometimes quickly, and they surprise us, they become fairly existential, or they begin to take place in existential rhetoric. All sides begin to declare that they're right and that the other side is dangerous. 
and that surrender might be unacceptable. Now you've got a conflict. When I believe something that involves my children that you're ruining is unacceptable, we have a problem. Now how do we work it out? Next stage these usually go through is then people choose political teams. And today our political, you don't need me to tell you, our political teams are uh, well chosen now. Each team has its own media, each team has its own consultants, each team has its political talking points. But then the media gets involved in history wars. The media loves, I'm, I'm not trashing the media, I know why they love history wars, because they matter. But the media then can also fuel these history fights that we have, and they can thrive on it. Uh, an example is the critical race theory so-called debate. Where is that a real thing, and where is that a real debate? Probably depends on which media you listen to or read. Then there's a stage in which the academics get involved. Oh, God. Uh, where authorities get involved. Museums weigh in. And people love museums. They're, they're actually the single most trusted disseminator of historical knowledge or information of all. They're even above grandparents yeah, when they do these surveys. We love museums, it turns out. There's something supposedly or very of objective and empirical about a museum. And we want them to be. Um, anyway, uh, the, the authorities weigh in. P the people who do research and actually know something. Then it becomes a fight. If there's a history war that's going to endure it all, it becomes a fight over the politics of knowledge. And people gain emotional attachments to their side of an issue. And often, in this country and in other countries, it gets all caught up in nationalism. Fate of the nation, fate of the country, the fate of the Constitution seems at stake. Now, I think the truth is, um, some good history can actually come out of these history wars, despite the fact that it goes through all these stages of media and craziness and school boards and all the rest. Some good history can happen out of this in the long run, because people might start paying attention. They might ask a historian, I mean, maybe, uh, to appear on a talk show or something. I've done a lot of these things now, radio mostly, but uh, the trouble with all that is if you, if you get two minutes, you're lucky. Well, professor, what do you think? Thank you very much. And now on to the next whatever we're doing. I did just get invited to something called the Monk Debates. Do you ever listen to those? M-U-N-K? Their podcasts? Maybe I shouldn't say yes to this. If you, if you don't know about it, then I shouldn't say yes to this. Anyway, but they claim to have all these important people who have done these debates. Well, they have a debate question. They get two people on to argue about it for an hour. And the one I was invited to do is, um, I mean, the, the debate question is, resolution, the United States is on the verge of a new civil war. I shouldn't laugh about that, but... And they asked me as though they already, I guess they already figured out what side I would take. They asked me to argue for the affirmative. And they've invited another person to argue the negative. Now, I haven't said yes yet. I mean, I, I, I might say, I don't know which side I want on that one. Because <laughs> if you know historians at all, students, you know that we like ambiguity. We like to answer with on the one hand, but on the other hand. Are we on the verge of some kind of conflict in this country? Whether it's a civil war is another matter. Are we in some low-grade political uh, struggle? Uh, low-grade in the sense that it's not exactly fully violent. 
um, are, are, do we have intractable, impossible issues? Well, probably yes. In some cases, we could all make our own list of six intractable issues that we believe in and they don't, whoever they is. Or maybe not. Maybe America will yet save itself at the local level, as some have argued. David Brooks is out arguing now, that at the local level, Americans are all right. They're going to their churches. They care about their schools, even though they're fighting about their schools. It's all right. They, they, they care about their local sports team, and don't we? We, we, we have community. We're building, we, we don't bowl together anymore as we used to, as a famous book has argued. But we do, we, we have other kinds of bowling, we're told, although the pandemic hurt those other kinds of bowling. Bowling is things, you guys may not know what bowling is now, it's a ball and a pin. Where I grew up, my working class father, he worked eight hours a day for his two bowling leagues. That's all that mattered in his life, and his two sons, and he, he went to his death deeply distressed that we both hated bowling. But, you know, maybe America's going to work its way through this because we've worked our way through a lot of other crises. A massive civil war, well, depends on who you ask about whether we worked our way through the civil war. 750,000 dead didn't work their way through that one. Uh, I don't know. I don't have any prescription. I do know we're in the midst of history wars. It's why we do history. It's why we need to look at people like Frederick Douglass, who lived much of the trajectory, as you know, of the whole 19th century. Think about the trajectory of his life, okay? You've read his narrative, at least, and maybe a few speeches. But he is born out on the eastern shore of Maryland, along a horseshoe bend in the Tuckahoe River, on the day in February 1818. That's before steamboats. Well, steamboats had been invented, but they, nobody, nobody saw them very often. They were barely anywhere on American rivers. Before the railroad. Nobody knew what a railroad was yet. Nobody knew what the telegraph was yet. Nobody even knew what the rotary press was. That's the press that made possible weekly and daily newspapers. And Douglas would build his career in part on newspapers, three of which he edited. All these elements, uh, these transportational communication elements of modernity of the 19th century, he's born before any of that happened. But he's going to live all the way to 1895, nearly the end of the 19th century, born a slave from nowhere in a backwater of the American Slave Society out on the eastern shore of Maryland. But he's going to live to 1895 in a whole new stage of modernity. By the time Douglas dies, they have steamships crossing the Atlantic in eight days, which was considered practically a miracle. And Douglas was fascinated with technology. Uh, he's going to live long enough for uh, this strange thing called an internal combustion engine. Although nobody really had cars yet. They were called carriages. And the first ones were built in my hometown. Um, he's going to live long enough uh, to see and here, a phonograph. So far as we know, his voice was never recorded, which is a shame. The greatest orator of the 19th century, uh, this phenomenal voice, as we're told over and over and over, never got recorded, at least not that we know of. And I don't think he was. Because about three months before he died, he went for dinner one night at a friend's house in Washington. And that friend played a phonograph recording of a black minister's voice, a sermon, whom Douglas knew. And when he got back home, he wrote this odd thing called a thank you letter for the dinner. And nobody does that anymore. Uh, and he went on and on and on in a letter about this magical, divine device, he called it, of the phonograph. And he says in that letter, is it possible the human voice could live forever? He's talking about himself there. I don't think he writes that letter if he'd ever been recorded. Um, and if any of you are collectors, and if you ever run across a recording of Douglas, will you call me first? I will make you an offer. 
because of that will be precious. I'm not kidding, call me. Um, anyway, uh, the trajectory of that, and then look what happens in between. <laughs> He's 20 years a slave. He comes of age as an adult, that adult writer who writes that narrative at age 27. Uh, and he comes of age then in his 30s with the great crisis over slavery as an editor of a newspaper, as an itinerant orator, as a quite soon very influential voice in this great American debate about whether its future would be slave or free. And then comes the Civil War, and he's, in, he's only in his 40s. This transformation, this apocalyptic obliteration of one America and remaking of a new happens in his 40s. And he has a lot to say about that. <laughs> and he lives the whole story of Reconstruction. It's glorious rise in his view, and it's despairing failure eventually on the other hand. And yet he's still going to live beyond that into the early years of the Jim Crow system and especially the early years of the lynching crisis. He doesn't die until five, six years into the, the, the serious crisis across the country with this, this new form of murder, uh, of lynching. In his last great speech, Lessons of the Hour, will be a, 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 a quite analytical three-part analysis of why lynching is happening. He first writes that as a 75-year-old man. Douglas's life was a history war. Douglas's life was at war with American history. Douglas's life was a contradiction of American history. He was born into a world where almost everybody assumed slavery was permanent. How could it be otherwise? This system so deeply rooted in the soil, in the labor system, and in the economy, and in the Constitution, to a great extent. How could it ever end? How would it ever end? But it ended in the middle of his life. Well, or did it? It ended and retransmogrified into other forms and modes and systems, some legal, some not. Uh, maybe we always have a history war in the United States because we are this strange thing, this wonderful, beautiful, still fairly strange thing, which is a republic born not only out of revolution, and we, it was, but born with creeds. We're a creedal country. Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, whatever else it is, it's a very important document, has four first principles right up front. The doctrine of sovereignty. The idea that a government, government does not exist unless the people give their consent. That, that's a big one. Your government doesn't supposed to, is not supposed to do anything without your consent. Now, consent gets you know, it gets expressed in dribbles and dribbles and dribbles, and sometimes we wonder if we ever gave consent to anything. And it, and it mouths that word equality. Jefferson had the audacity to, to use the word. Americans are still trying to figure out what that word means, and we probably always will be. It also had that phrase, the right of revolution. What is that? And then Jefferson used that, that, that most, that broadest of all conceivable rights, the right to liberty. And what is liberty? Some people say it's your right to carry an AR-15 at any age, anywhere you want. That's, that's liberty. And under the law, in some states, they're not wrong. Some people say liberty 
has to do with a lot of other things, and I won't go there. Our Supreme Court is this time to decide right now a certain kind of liberty that has existed for 50 years under the Constitution and may not anymore. Uh, and there are a thousand other ways, 10,000 other ways that liberty has been defined. Or as Abraham Lincoln put it so poignantly, in, the, in 1864, one of the dark moments of the Civil War, it's the summer of 64, Lincoln said, everybody declares for liberty. The Civil War is still going on. It's not over. So everybody declares for liberty. The trouble we have is we don't agree on what we mean. <laughs> um, actually, he said it more eloquently than that last phrase I used. So we're a creedal nation. We started with creeds. And if you start with creeds and you're, you're, you're a country that grows and grows and grows, that was James Madison's worry, wasn't it? This place would just grow too big and it couldn't be governed. Um, Founders didn't really believe a big nation could actually be a republic. They were worried about that. We got really big, and we're still a republic. It's fairly miraculous. But what happens if you get so big and so diverse and have so many different definitions of liberty that you can't hold it together anymore? Or what happens if your history, as Douglas imagined, so many times in so many ways. What happens if your history gives you a country that is so pluralistic, so diverse, that that itself becomes its survival, becomes its beauty, becomes its power, becomes its model, if you choose to believe in it. He gave a speech in 1869 called the Composite Nation. I don't want to dwell a long time on it. I can give a whole lecture on that if we wanted me to, but we don't want me to. Um, but it's an amazing speech because it's not very well known. It's not one of his most famous speeches, like the Fourth of July speech or the Freedmen's Memorial Lincoln Monument unveiling speech and some others. But it, and it's a fairly short speech. But what he does in this speech, and the context is everything, as always, what we do in history, it's all historians do is just tell you what the context is. That's why they have historians, by the way. Um, we really do exist to just tell people what happened. <laughs> no, no, we do more than that. But in this speech, he imagines an America, 1869, that is becoming multiracial, multicultural, and multireligious, multiethnic, multireligious, and could become a model for the world over time. And he argues for this because he says, we just had an Armageddon. We've just destroyed ourselves in this war, and now we've reinvented ourselves in these three constitutional amendments, the 13th ending slavery, the 14th of creating birthright citizenship and equality before law and due process all in two sentences of the 14th Amendment, which could be still the only thing that holds us together. And then in the 15th Amendment, which had just passed, it would be ratified the year after he first gave this speech, which was the Voting Rights Amendment. Douglas came to, he says, look, look what we've just done. The United States, he argues in this speech, has a chance to be something no one else has ever been, ever, anywhere, a republic of increasingly wildly diverse people, diverse by race, ethnicity, religion, language, and yet all living under equality before law and a common constitution. He says, why not? It's, it's like this, it, it reads, we were saying this at lunch, I forget. It reads like a multiculturalism manifesto from about 1998 put out by a public school. It reads like every university and college's mission statement today. He said it 150 some years ago. He said, why can't we do this? 
And by the way, he's, he's, he's even arguing in this speech that the United States should now export this. He becomes a kind of soft imperialist. He becomes an expansionist. He thinks the United States should now spread these ideas and this new constitution of theirs to the Caribbean, to South America, to anywhere where people are still oppressed by systems, systems of bondage, slavery, servitude of any kind. That's bold. And in the middle of that speech, he makes about a five, six page aggressive argument for Chinese immigration, which I think surprised his audience, although it shouldn't have because it was just then becoming a very big issue in the United States. The Chinese immigration was coming in, obviously across the Pacific to California. The Chinese were being employed in the building of the railroads, employed in American mining, and it was becoming a huge controversy, a huge controversy. The first uh, Chinese Exclusion Act will be passed in 1874, which was against women. Chinese women were excluded by law. Uh, then the, the, the big Chinese Exclusion Act wouldn't pass until 1882, but Douglas was anticipating this. And he makes this amazing case in the speech. He says, look, Chinese civilization is three, 4,000 years old as far as we know. They've created an amazing culture. They, they know science. They know, they know things we don't know. Let them come. We'll improve. But he puts his faith, and this is classic American, Americanism. He puts his faith in the melting pot model of American immigration. It's the assimilationist model. He says, they'll assimilate. They'll buy into our creed. Yeah, they got very different languages, very different religions. We don't even know what their religions are. But they will, they will fold themselves into our creeds because our creeds are just so good and universal and permanent. So he says, get ready. And as classic Douglas, he uses all kinds of nature metaphor. They're coming across the rivers. They're coming over the mountains. They're coming, Americans. Get ready. They're coming to America. Was it Neil Diamond did that song? It's terrible. Not, not his best work. But, you know, you read that speech and you think, whoa. If people could believe this 150 years ago, how are we doing with that? How are we doing with that composite nation? Some days it probably looks like we're doing really well. Have you ever attended a citizenship swearing in? I mean, I'm, I'm a born citizen, but I've never, I have attended a couple at the New York Historical Society where you see the, the world swearing allegiance. I mean, it's incredibly moving but when, you, when you see these events. And you realize, yeah, it's the whole world is coming to America. They still are. They always have been. <laughs> They're going to keep doing it. No matter how much we fight over immigration policy. So maybe we've always been this history war. And sometimes there are elements of our past that can help us understand that. Although we're in an acute one now. All right, I want to focus on Douglas a little bit here. Uh, maybe to just give you some broader context about this, this former slave who wrote that narrative uh, and then was so good at these speeches. I mean, how did a kid born a slave on the eastern shore of Maryland who never did learn who his father was, although his father was white and possibly one of his two owners, he knew his mother's name, but basically had to make up memories of her to remember her. He could remember his grandmother, Betsy, pretty well. You know that from the narrative. But she left him when he was six at the Y House and just left him with the other children. And she was gone. How did that orphan, and that's the first fact about his life that we need to understand, he's an orphan. You know, everything can go with being an orphan in terms of psychology and aspiration and security and all the rest. This kid's an orphan. How did that orphan become Frederick Douglass? How did he get from that side of the Chesapeake to the other side? To the greatest lecture halls in the Western world? 
to the White House advising five or six presidents. How did he end up writing 1,200 pages of autobiography? Where does that genius you read in some of these speeches come from? How could that man, when so young, or for that matter, at any age in his life, do what he did with language? Well, when you're writing somebody's biography, you're supposed to have answers to all that. Huh. Well, a few answers. But you know, with whatever the, whatever, whatever genius is, and that's a, I, do, I try not to use that word very much, because nobody knows what it is. Well, I, I mean, I, we kind of know it in music. I mean, there are just some musicians. I mean, how can, you know, they do it when they're 17 years old, and you think, okay, that's genius. I mean, how can you sit at a piano and do that? Or, uh, you know, Little Wolfgang Mozart, you know, there are a few around, and you just, you just hear them, see them, and you say, okay, that's genius. But it's not so easy in other, other ways, other fields, other modes of, uh, of expression. In writing this book, I had to do what all, his, all biographers do. I had to decide how to organize Douglas's life. And then now uh, you may, I mean, I don't know, maybe we don't want to think historians, you know, impose organization on the past, but of course we do. I had to decide eventually, what are my big themes here? And the truth is, I was writing it for a long time before I actually knew what all the themes were. The themes came out, evolved as I was writing. I had some clear ideas that I started with. But it took time and writing to realize, oh, okay, that's what I'm talking about. I ended up organizing the book, whether I knew it at the time or not, when I sat down at the end and I thought, okay, what are my big elements? I came up with six, and I'll just name them for you quickly. The first is words. That's not going to surprise you. You've read the narrative, at least. You've read some of the speeches. We know Douglas, first and foremost, in his words. We will always know Douglas, first and foremost, in his words. He also lived a remarkable life. There's a heroic life here, especially the early life, that escaped slave. I find the latter part of Douglas's life, in many ways, even more interesting, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Turns out the aging Douglas can be just as fascinating as that heroic young Douglas, and he had just, well, he had even more conflicts. But words, words, and the way that he learned to use them, the way that he developed an amazing facility with language, the way that he could hear the music of phrasing in his head, the way he could somehow just burst out with a metaphor. Now, he used way too many adjectives <laughs> for our modern ears. Our man sometimes would just float into eight adjectives in a row, and you want to say, Fred, enough already. But you can read Douglas. And you read a passage and you just, whoo, you just got to go back and read it again. And whoo, it hits you. Like, where did it come from? How did, he, how did he do that? Whether it's about political crisis or whether it's about the meaning of slavery or, or any other issue. Lynching, violence, war, abolitionism. In fact, I want to I wanna actually show you an example. Or actually, try to read you. You know, it's it's one thing to say this person's a genius of language, and oh my God, could could he write? Let me show you an ex just one brief example of his style. He had a style. Now, a lot of you, as undergraduate writers, are still seeking your style, your voice. That doesn't come easy. I was a terrible writer when I was an undergraduate. I don't know if that makes you feel bad or good. I was a terrible writer when I was an undergraduate. I overwrote. Ugh. Professors would hand stuff back and say, well, as an undergrad, they would hand back and say, uh, very purple. That's meant I'm way overwrite. And then in grad school, my mentor on the first paper I ever wrote for him, first paper I ever wrote for Dick Sewell, who became my beloved mentor, he said, white? 
you need not try to surprise us in every sentence. And I got it. I didn't, I didn't cure it for a long time. Sometimes the best 10 sentences in a row just have a little clarity. They're not shocking you. They're not overturning the world. And then after you've laid out a little clarity, clarity then maybe comes the big guns. Uh, Douglas could write with both substance and style. Here's an example. In My Bondage and My Freedom, which is the second autobiography, uh, probably you haven't read that. The narrative is the one we so often teach because it's nice and short and it's an amazing text all by itself. But in Bondage and Freedom, he writes 10 years later, the second autobiography, which is 440 pages long, is a much more political autobiography. He's a much more mature writer, it's much more sophisticated, and he has a whole different politics by the time he's writing bondage from what he wrote in the narrative. He's no longer a Garrisonian, to say the least. He go, he, he, it's the section, and, he, and some sections are much longer in bondage and freedom than they were back in the narrative. He's describing the Y plantation this huge plantation where he lived as a child for about 18, 19 months in the ages of six and eight. Really formative memories. I've been there many times. I was just there again a month or so ago with the, actually a congressional delegation, interesting time. Um, and he's describing the wealth of the place. Now Douglas rarely took up a topic without using it you know, coming out the other end with, as William James might have said, some cash value. The immense wealth, he wrote, and this was a, this was the largest plantation holding in all of Maryland, owned by the Lloyd family. It had, on, on the various Lloyd farms around there, uh, between three and four hundred slaves, uh, several thousand acres of property. It's a gigantic almost industrialized plantation. He says, this immense, immense wealth, this gilded splendor, this profusion of luxury already, what's he doing? Repetition, repetition, a cadence of repetition. This exemption from toil, this life of ease, this sea of plenty, I, what of it all? Now, you just got to read on, right? If you've read that, you just got to keep reading. Uh, he knows what he's doing here. He loved repetition. Then he begins to throw down warnings about future reckonings. This is Douglas the prophet. Quote, lurking beneath all their dishes of invisible, lurking beneath all their dishes are invisible spirits of evil ready to feed the self-deluded gormandizers with aches, pains, fierce temper, lombardo, and gout. <laughs> you can almost hear him chuckling. He's, he's telling us in a quite biblical way, their souls cannot rest. To the pampered love of ease, he goes on, there is no resting place. What is pleasant today is repulsive tomorrow. What is soft now is hard at another time. What is sweet in the morning is bitter in the evening. And then before he ends that passage of all of these cadences and repetitions where he's just laying it on the master class, he just gives it over to Isaiah, which was such a typical move for Doug. He gives it over to his favorite Hebrew prophet, it tended to be Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, sometimes Ezekiel, sometimes Amos, but especially Jeremiah and, and, and Isaiah. He gives it over to them. He says, neither to the wicked nor to the idler is there any solid peace, troubled like the restless sea. He didn't even go on to complete the passage about no rest for the wicked which is one of my mother's favorite phrases when I was a kid. I had no idea what she meant. I didn't know she was getting it from Isaiah. I don't think she knew she was getting it from Isaiah. 
but there it was. Now, what you see in just that one little, I don't know if it worked out loud, but you get both style and argument with Douglas in almost everything he's writing. In the narrative, if he's writing about a certain character, maybe one of those overseers, like the guy named Gore, which is not a made-up name, by the way, or somewhere else when he's talking about Thomas Auld, his owner, or he's talking about Sophia Auld, the lovely, angelic-like woman who teaches him his alphabet and his reading until she turns on him. Whatever he's writing about, he's going to do it with style, but there's also an argument going on. He's taking you somewhere. That's what great writers do. So words, and words becomes a central theme of my entire biography. The second theme, and I'll be much quicker with the others, is the autobiography. In Douglas, you can't avoid the autobiography uh, if you're a biographer. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. The problem is the autobiographies are both your source and your subject. You have to use them. They're, they're amazingly rich for some things, especially his early life especially the 20 years as a slave. They're, they're absolutely crucial for that. And they're very revealing for that. For a lot of the rest of his life, the autobiographies are in some ways in your way. Those autobiographies become your subject as a biographer in part because you have to keep explaining, why does this man keep writing about himself over and over and over? What is it that he has to keep telling his story? Why does he feel compelled to do that? There are many reasons, not least of which was, and I say this in my book, that he, uh, I believe, he believed that it was his responsibility, that his life had become much more than his with the success of the narrative. And then, by the way, the second autobiography sold like crazy, too. It sold 18,000 copies the first year. That's a good sale today, <laughs> much less 1855. Anyway. Uh, he carried now the burden of his story, and he felt like he had to keep telling. His story belonged to his people. He had to keep telling it over and over. Trouble is, like any good autobiographer, he hides more than he tells. A great deal about his life he's never going to say a word about, especially his private life. We've got to get to that some other way. A third big theme in the book, and I've already alluded to it, is, uh, is the Bible. Uh, I'm not the first scholar on Douglas to stress this, to search for it, to argue that he was deeply steeped, particularly in the Old Testament. But I think I went further, some great risks, uh, than anyone else has. And I say risks because I'm still waiting. This book's been out three years now, and I may have dodged the bullet. But I'm not sure. There are a couple of theologians present. I'm still waiting for the review of my book by a theologian who's going to take me to task for not understanding what I was really doing with his Old Testament rhetoric. I used to wake up at night thinking about this. I don't anymore, but I used to. Like, they're going to find me out. I don't have any formal theology training. I've read a lot of theology. I love reading about theology. I have good friends who are theologians who told me what to read which is one of the ways to get educated in this world. Go to a good college like Providence and then make some friends who will tell you what to read. And I, I, I should name these theologians, I'll spare you that, but they got me reading certain interpreters of the Old Testament like Walter Brueggen. And they got me reading people like uh, Robert Alter, who famously recently tr translated the Bible again. Um, and, but in particular, a dear friend, actually a rabbi in uh, New Haven, uh, said, David, you've got to read Abraham Heschel. And you've got to read him carefully. Because if you're going to call Douglas a prophet, you've got to know what a prophet is. And I, he, knew I wanted, he knew I was playing with the idea of putting prophet in the title of my book. But I was really, honestly, afraid of that. Prophet's a big word, folks. You don't throw that around easily. Oh, that was prophetic. Or she's prophetic. Sometimes all we mean by that is they seem predictable. But that's not what prophets do. 
Abraham Heschel was probably the greatest uh, Jewish theologian of the 20th century, but he transcended Judaism. He was read all over the world uh, in English and Hebrew and other languages. Uh, there's a brand new biography that just came out on Heschel by um, uh, Julian Zelizer, by the way, which you should get if you're interested. But Heschel helped open up for me a way of understanding Douglas as a prophet in the way he used language. Not so much in his faith, because his faith is still elusive. Heschel wrote many, many books, but he especially wrote this huge tome called The Prophets, which is about 600 pages of defining what a prophet is. <laughs> and his prophets, of course, were the Hebrew prophets. Among the many, many passages from Heschel that helped me, moved me, took me somewhere was this passage. The prophet is human, wrote Heschel. Yet, he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of our minds. Often his words begin to burn where our conscience ends an assaulter of our mind. There's another place where Heschel says, a true pro and he says prophets are very few. He warns over and over, if you meet someone and they say they're a prophet, they're probably not. Prophets don't say they're prophets. At least not in the Judeo-Christian tradition. They become prophets because there's something godlike and divine in the world that made them do it. A real prophet, at least in the Old Testament, didn't choose to be a prophet. Jeremiah hated it, rejected it, resisted it, and then became an incredible prophet. And I think so did Douglas. There's another place where Heschel says the true prophet has probably been shattered by something in his or her life in order to shatter us. And then Heschel says, because that's the job of the prophet. <laughs> job description. Shatter people. Call them out. Remind them of all their declensions. Whether those are uh, uh, political, national, uh, secular, uh, civic declensions or religious declensions. And that line is blurred when you're talking about Douglas. So Heschel helped me, along, along with others, to, to understand how Douglas would... You cannot pick up a Douglas speech from the earliest ones, when he's this young Garrisonian orator out on the circuit, right to the end of his life, without seeing the Hebrew prophets employed. The great Fourth of July speech, which I know some of you have read and been taught, has no less than six or seven biblical uses in that speech. Three by Isaiah, at least one Jeremiah, two Psalms, and I'm forgetting the exact numbers. And my favorite moment in that speech, and I have many favorite moments in that speech, and I don't know if you've done this yet, folks, students, go read that baby out loud with a friend. Read it out loud. And if you're in theater studies, perform it because that's what he did. My favorite moment in that speech is where he says, pardon me, and I know he must have just beat on the lectern. Why have you invited me here? Fourth of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. And then he says, what we need is sacrilegious irony. Not just irony, sacrilegious irony. And then he just floats. Doesn't announce his text because he knows his audience, knows the Bible. He just floats into the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, there we laid, there we sat down, we laid our harps on the willows, and we sang one of the songs of Zion. That speech is Douglas saying to that audience, you invited me here to sing for you, but I'm not gonna sing. I'm going to shout, and I'm going to make you hurt, 
I'm going to remind you of your hypocrisy and your declension, and I'm going to challenge you to be better. And that, he left out the ending of that 137th Psalm, of course, which is the smashing of babies under the rocks. Thank God he left that out. It's a horrible part of that psalm. I love that psalm until the last one. <laughs> what? what was, whoever wrote that psalm, come on. All right, lastly, I have three other big themes in this biography that I found I, I was doing before I knew it. <laughs> sort of. Uh, the fourth is that Douglas's life is in so many ways the path of a radical outsider, radical abolitionist, always on the outside of power, trying to, you know, pound his way in, becoming over time a kind of political insider. And it becomes a big theme in his life. It goes on for decades. And there's so many uh, telling uh, lessons in that for our own time. You can think of a lot of other leaders in American history, especially in the Civil Rights era, who led the revolution and then got elected. Mayors, congressmen, senators. And one of those people, for God's sake, an old community organizer got elected president of the United States. What happens if you've been a politi you've been an outsider all along, and now you're inside and you're running the place? Or you're sort of running the place? What compromises do you make? What rivalries do you make? What happens to your own soul and your own psyche? A fifth big theme, and it's true of all biography, I think, some more than others, if you like to read biography, this is one thing readers, of, and a lot of people who do, this is one thing readers of biography are always testing. I just did a, 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 a book group the other day on Zoom, a group of retirees up in Cambridge who had read my book, and God had they read the book. And, oh my, they knew better than I did. Oh, Lord. This is the theme they wanted to talk about. It's the relationship of Douglas's public and private life, his two marriages. His relationships with two European women, Julia Griffiths from Britain, Attila Yassin from Germany, and then all these personal rivalries he had in the latter part of his life with the next generation of black leaders, and then all the conflicts he had with his adult children, and eventually his 21 grandchildren, all of whom, with the exception of his oldest son, ended up financially dependent on him, public and private. I made a vow while writing the biography and I don't always live up to it, but I tried so hard that no single chapter was going to be just the private life or just the public life. They were going to be told in tandem, because that's the way we live. How many days do you get up and only live, I mean, if you're in any way a public person, if you're a professional person, how many days do you get up and only live your public life? No, probably begins privately, <laughs> and it's probably going to end privately. None of us live one or the other. It's always both. And that's hard to do sometimes, but I was insistent with myself. If this chapter is mostly about reconstruction, the big issues, and so on and so forth, nevertheless, I'm working the family in there, because that's there in his life every day, and it's a big problem. <laughs> And last but not least, a, a, a big theme of anyone working on Douglas uh, is, uh, is Douglas the artist, the intellectual, the thinker, the creator. Uh, from the moment he becomes uh, an escaped slave and then a public person to the day he dies, you have to deal with Douglas as what he becomes which is a writer, a thinker, a political philosopher, a legal philosopher, a writer of fiction, one work of fiction. He wrote, uh, he wrote quite a bit of poetry. He kept most of it, thankfully, in a drawer. <laughs> it wasn't his best mode. His mode was prose poetry. That's where you find his poetry. All right, a last, uh, just a last couple thoughts. I've kept you long enough. And a thousand other things one can say about Douglas. 
there's a thousand quotes. I actually, during the course of uh, doing all these talks on this book and so on, I sat down once and I put together a favorite collection of my Doug uh, my favorite collection of Douglas quotes. It, it ran to three and four pages. It ran to about 40 different quotes and so on and so forth, and I just quit doing it. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but I do have one little favorite. It's, it's, it's not necessarily the most eloquent, but it's one of the most lasting. It's the last sentence of my bondage and my freedom. Second autobiography, it's 1855, he's 37 years old. He's just written this second long version of his life. In the, he's planting that baby in the midst of the political crisis over slavery. The country's tearing apart its political system. John Brown's out in Kansas raising Cain and hell and worse. And Douglas has to decide how to end that book. And he ends by saying, as long as God allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. My voice, my pen, my vote. Now his voice and his pen is, of course, how we know him. Why we know him. That's why he left all this prose poetry for us to think about it, about the great American slavery problem, the great American race problem, the great American problem over states' rights and federalism, and go on and on and on. But he added the vote. Now, he could vote in New York State in 1855 but most blacks couldn't. And obviously most blacks in the United States couldn't vote because most of them were slaves. In order to vote in, even in New York State in 1855, a black man had to own $250 worth of real property in order to vote. Those who didn't own property didn't vote. But Douglas came to view, right or wrong, and political theorists love to argue about this, whether he overstressed the power of the vote. But he came to see the right to vote as essentially the first right. The right he believed that would protect all others. There's nothing about the right to vote in the Declaration of Independence. There's nothing about the right to vote in the Bill of Rights. Political rights are not there. They evolve with time. History made our political rights. And there's no right we're fighting any more about again today in our history wars than this right to vote. He once called it the ring of fire protecting all other rights. Now you could say he, over, he, he overdid that. Because sometimes, what, what if you're going to the voting poll and a lynch mob kills you? Well, that vote didn't, didn't save you. That's true. But what if it didn't exist? It wouldn't be a voting poll and it wouldn't be, need to be a mob. My voice, my pen, my vote. And frankly, unless you have great wealth in the United States, those three things are all any of us have. You have a voice. Some, some get to use their voice more easily. You have a pen, although most of us don't write. I mean, right for the public, what a lot of us do. But we all think we ought to have the right to vote, or do we? Thank you. I'd be happy to take Accusations, questions, and comments. If there are any, please come to the uh, microphones, and we ask for a student first, if possible. Yeah, that's a good idea. Come on. Come on. Come on. You've read the narrative. You've got to do Don't make me think of questions. I was on a meeting the other day, 28 of so-called Sterling professors in the United States. I was in the hoity-toity people in the United States. First, 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 
and mission of the university. The chair of this group made an opening statement, quite poignant and interesting, and then said, who wants to go first? <laughs> and these people are not quiet. Nobody spoke. Finally. Some fool raised his hand and said, yeah, okay, I'll tell you what I think's wrong with the university. And once he did that, everything just went, you know, Everybody just started complaining about what they wanted to complain about. It just takes long. And you'll be remembered fondly. Not for what you ask, because no one will remember you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. More interesting or more? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that question, because I, I didn't really get to talk about this. The question is, why do I think the post-Civil War Douglas, the older Douglas, who lives 30 years after the Civil War, why do I find that him more interesting? I don't know if it's more interesting, but it's equal, if not more interesting, than this younger heroic Douglas. The reason is, to me, reasonably simple. One is life becomes so richly complicated. His family, as I said. His children grow to adulthood. Four survive, well, his fifth child, Annie, died at age 11. Tragic event for their family back in 1850, 1860. His family grows into this robust, but, but struggling, complicated, conflicted family. Uh, he develops personal rivalries with the next generation of black leaders. I have a lot in my book on that. He, he develops oh, ugly, bitter rivalries with John Mercer Langston, Richard T. Greener, George Washington Williams. They were all at least 20 years younger than Douglas. They were all freeborn. They were not born slaves. And like all generations, they wanted to knock Douglas off, off the pedestal. They knocked the old man off. I mean, look at this former slave who gets all the attention, takes up all the air. You know, Langston went to Oberlin College. He was a brilliant guy. He was a lawyer. He was dean of the Howard Law School and so on and so on. Richard T. Greener was the first black graduate of Harvard. He thought he was pretty cool. Who's this guy Douglas? He gets all the attention. So, bitter rivalry and they are exposed in the newspapers of Washington, D.C., and I got access to a private collection of documents that I didn't even talk about, which is the reason I did the book, which is chock full of thousands of clippings from those Washington, D.C. newspapers that you couldn't otherwise find. But also there's this maturing, developing Douglas politician who becomes a, a member, eventually a quite stalwart member of the Republican Party. He campaigned for every Republican presidential candidate from Lincoln's second election in 1864 to the end of his life, to the 1892 election, um, which the Republicans lost. Um, and then there's so many other issues. He gets into all kinds of bitter debates over things like the Kansas exodus, or over whether to stay in the Republican Party or what to do when the Supreme Court obliterates the 14th Amendment in the Cruikshank case of 1876, and then even worse in the so-called civil rights in U.S. v. Stanley case of 1883. Douglas is, is viscerally challenged in his later life at somehow preserving and holding and hanging on to that victory of emancipation to that victory that leads to these three great amendments to the Constitution, that remaking of the United States. He's always and everywhere trying to save that against the odds. And he's actually losing that battle. An aging old radical who's become a partial political insider trying to save the revolution they're losing is a fascinating story. I wish that's what the movie was going to be about, but it's not. 
the last screenplay I read is this is going to be a five-year slice of his life, and it's, eh. anyway. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, he's a changing thinker, too, over time. You, 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 you see that, you, you have to chart that. Um, and there's just so many moments in the latter part of his life where you, you see just how human he was. His humanity would come out, his desperation would sometimes come out in letters to his daughter. His oldest child was his daughter, Rosette, he tended to open up with her, as fathers sometimes do with daughters more than their sons. Oh my goodness, some of the letters he writes to her, they're heartbreaking, they're, I wish we had even more of them. He writes a letter when he's out in Chicago at the uh, Chicago World's Fair, Columbian Exposition, he's there as the representative of Haiti. It's a very racist event. He's trying to navigate that again. That, by the way, how Douglas navigated racism in that last third of his life. That's a book unto itself. But he writes this letter to his daughter. He's, and he's not well. He's already got probably pleurisy. He's got heart disease by then. He didn't know it. Cardiology wasn't invented until essentially the year he died. Uh, he's, his hands are shaking. He writes to his daughter and says, have you brought the apples in from the orchard? Because I want some good applesauce this winter. And, oh, the peaches. You know how I love peaches when the ground just right, Rosetta, the way you do. And I just want to come home. I want to sit in the corner by the fireplace and just be by myself. You read it, you think, no kidding. <laughs> he probably wanted to do that a thousand times. He just didn't write it down that often. That's an old man who's still out there trying to fight the fight, but knowing he's probably dying and he'd really rather go home and sit by the fireplace and eat some applesauce. That's me. But the way he navigated racism, oh man, he converted it into humor half the time old age because he had to, to kind of survive it. He got Jim Crowed more times than you could ever count. He had a favorite thing he would do when he went into a restaurant, a tavern, a hotel, and if they denied him a table, this was earlier in his life, not so much late in his life, but middle of his life. He did this a number of times. If he was denied a, a place to sit in the main restaurant dining room, he was as loud as he could, he'd say, well, where do you feed your dogs? No, no, tell me where the dogs are. I'll eat with the dogs. And the people in the restaurant were suddenly on his side. It usually worked. They would say, oh, don't make that man eat with the dogs. And they would sit. And Douglas would tell about it later and say, eh, eh, got the bastards on that one. I mean, a lot of us would might not have a sense of humor to deal with that, but he did, you know. That comes through. It comes from experience of dealing with this system of, you know, racism. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Frederick Douglass is, was arguably the most photographed individual in the 19th century. Right. Uh, and um, as I understand it, and scholars have done quite a lot of re research on this recently, right. uh, he really um, determined how he wanted his photographs mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. uh, do you talk about uh, his photographs as a form of, of autobiography? I do indeed. Uh, not as much as my friends who did this book. You may know the book. I hope you do. It's called Picturing Frederick Douglass. It came out about four years ago by Zoe Tra, John Stauffer, and Celeste Bernier. It is uh, almost every extant photograph and cartoon of Douglass that we know of. Uh, the count they came to in that book is, I believe, 162 extant photos. Well, we've now found two or three more. I found one that just happened. It literally fell out of a scrapbook I was looking in at the New York 
Historical Society. It's a photograph of Douglas in Ireland in 1886. It's in my book. It shows him in front of a thatched hut. Why was he the most photographed person of the 19th century? There are several possible answers for that. One is that he traveled so much. I speculate in my book that with the one exception of Mark Twain, he may have been the most traveled American of the 19th century, I mean, more miles. I can't prove that. I, I, did sit, I did sit down once and tried to calculate the total miles of all of his lecture tours for like a three-year period. And I tried to extrapolate from that, and I realized you're not going to get this. Uh, because he traveled so much, everywhere he went, local photographers would want to take his photograph. That's one reason. The second reason is, as you just suggested, and the Stauffer Trod volume really shows this, he wanted to use photography. He wanted to use that technology, this new technology. He loved this new technology. Uh, kind of the back room of a museum in Kansas City called the Nelson Atkins, no, not the, no, the Nelson something museum in Kansas City. They had never displayed it. It's gorgeous, but they never have. Yeah, well, we just haven't put it up. Uh, and some of these have been found in private collections and, and, and other ways. There, there will probably be more. There's this on again, off again, maybe useless debate about who's the most photographed. There are now some people saying, really, it's actually Ulysses Grant. There may be more Grant photos. Who knows? Uh, guess who used to be second until Grant kind of nudged them out? second in most photographs of the 19th century. It's just trivia play. We'll play some trivia with me. Who do you suppose was photographed almost as many times as Douglas? Not Lincoln. See, if it was Lincoln, I probably wouldn't have asked, right? It's just too obvious. Not Lincoln. Hmm? I think saloons. Maybe that doesn't help, sorry. Sorry? No, but you're in the right genre. Who? No, not quite. No, but that's interesting. That's very interesting. Custer. George Armstrong. Apparently, his picture was up in every saloon in the American West by the 1880s. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, Douglas used photography, though, for, for a kind of social, political purpose, um, very much so. He also carefully selected the frontispieces on his autobiography. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I know that John Brown and Douglas didn't have the best relationship prior <laughs> to the raid, um, that he thought John Brown was too radical. But after the raid, he made a comment that really stuck with me when I heard it, and um, he said that John Brown was the most influential white man or the most important white man. Yep. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think made um, Douglas change his mind so much after all the violence happened? Martyrdom on the cross, also known as the gallows. Um, I have a whole chapter on the relationship with John Brown in my book. I hadn't originally planned that until I got into the sources and I realized this is a big deal. I have been meeting 11 times between about 1847 and 1859. Uh, they were not deep, close friends, but they were close associates over these years in the kinds of schemes Brown was involved in. And Brown was always trying to enlist Douglas because Douglas was Douglas in his schemes, especially Harper's Ferry. He never tried to recruit Douglas to go out to Kansas, but he surely did try to recruit him to go to Harper's Ferry with him, and Douglas had the great good sense not to, because he, he saw it, I think rightly, as a suicide mission. Now, I'll say this, I'll say two other things quickly about this. Douglas was always interested in listening to John Brown as long as John Brown, this is, this is what I found revealing in my research on this. And there are a few John Brown scholars who have done all this too. He was always interested in John Brown while Brown was talking about 
radical schemes of funneling slaves out of the upper south into the north by clandestine means, by bands of maybe warriors. Um, what, uh, what Brown at one point called the subterranean passageway. Another way of saying Underground Railroad, I guess. But this was, this was going to be a semi-violent overground railroad because Douglas got increasingly desperate in the 1850s down to the secession crisis and the war that there was going to be no other way to attack slavery because they were losing in politics. They were losing in the Supreme Court. After the Dred Scott case, where's the hope? But when he found out that Brown's plan was a raid on Harper's Fair, the largest federal arsenal in the United States, was when Douglas realized, no, uh, that is not only not going to work, he's going to get everybody killed. But he was loyal enough to go all the way down to Pennsylvania and meet with Brown in the old stone quarry for two nights, you know, one night and two days about a month and a half before the raid, when Brown got one last chance to try to recruit him to join. To his dying day, Douglas was blamed by members of Brown's surviving family. A lot of Brown's children died because of Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry was a total disaster for John Brown's family. To his dying day, Members of the Brown family, a, a, a daughter and a son in particular, who ended up living in Pasadena, California, up, up above the city on, on the mountaintop, they blamed Douglas for the failure of Harper's Ferry. There was always this myth in the John Brown family that Douglas was going to show up. Douglas was going to bring 400 warriors. Douglas had all these soldiers at his, disp at his disposal. No, he didn't. He didn't have anybody at his disposal. But this story, you know, it's like great misinformation. Once it catches, it works. And they blamed him. However, as soon as, <coughs> sorry, as soon as Brown hung on the, on the gallows, sorry, for that, um, Douglas knew exactly what to do. He helped create the martyrdom of John Brown. I just went to the epigraph in my chapter, which comes from speech. Douglas gave a John Brown eulogy speech many times the rest of his life. Many different versions of it, but they're all pretty much the same story. He argued that John Brown was far more useful, he said this explicitly, dead than he'd ever been alive. This is a passage. John Brown's raid upon Harper's Ferry was all his own, said Douglas. His zeal in the cause of freedom was infinitely superior to mine. Mine was as the taper of his was as the burning sun. I could speak for the slave. John Brown could fight for the slave. I could live for the slave. John Brown could die for the slave. That's beautiful rhetoric. But Douglas, in the wake of the raid, of course, escaped barely by the skin of his teeth back to Rochester and across uh, Lake Erie uh, and held out for three weeks at Niagara Falls where he actually still edited his newspaper and sent in his essays, but then fled to Britain because of the warrant for his arrest that was out. Uh, the truth is, Douglas thought Brown was a terrible strategist, but he was so useful dead. Douglas understood the meaning of martyrdom in a Christian society, and he made the most of, of the dead John Brown. And so did the country, didn't it? At recruiting speeches in 63, when Douglas went out on the circuit recruiting black men for the Union Army, he would often end his recruiting speech by leading the, you know, a, a hall of 2,000 people in singing John Brown's body. That'd be hard to resist. There's Mr. D singing John Brown's body. You at least got to sing along, even if you don't enlist. So thanks for that question, because it's a tech. And the, the, Harper, the whole Harper's Ferry story is a huge turning point in, in the history of Douglas's own family. Because he has to leave the country. He leaves to go to Britain for six weeks. I'm sorry, six months. He doesn't know if he can ever come back. And he leaves Anna 
you know, with a family of five children, uh, four of whom are reaching teenage and I guess Rosetta was almost 20. Um, and, and little Annie, the 11 year old, her mother's namesake dies while Douglas is in Britain. And that's the reason he comes back. Not even knowing if he'd be arrested, but he knows he has to come back because his daughter's dead. So it's a, it's a big turning point in, in, in Douglas' life. He was never arrested, by the way, because in the wake of John Brown's hanging, and in the hanging of two others of Brown's uh, captured men, it was an election year, 1860. And the commission appointed by Congress to study the Harper's Ferry conspiracy was chaired by none other than Jefferson Davis. And the wisdom of Jefferson Davis and others around him said, we're not arresting any more people. We're not going to create any more martyrs. These horrible, fanatical, terrible abolitionists already have enough martyrs. No more arrests. Now, Douglas did not know that when he came back from Britain. He will learn that after he gets back. They're not likely to come for you. But when he came back to Rochester, he came in through Canada, secretly, you know, to be with his family. And he sits tight, quietly, for about two months until he gets the sense that they're not going to prosecute anybody else. Then he goes out on the circuit and tries to campaign for Abraham Lincoln. And his heart was in. Sorry, but that's a good question. Thank you. You bet. How about this side of the room? One more? Mm. Uh, you sure you don't want to ask me why he never talks about his wife and his autobiography? You sure? They don't want to know that. They don't want to know that. They already know that. <laughs> Join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Blight for coming. We will be going and continue. Please join us for refreshments and conversation in the uh, fishbowl right across the way.